Hello and welcome to NDOT's first ever virtual town hall on the topic of work zone safety. My name is Scott Manning. I'm NDOT's Deputy Chief of Staff. Thank you for joining us and being part of tonight's conversation. We have Hoosiers from all across the state of Indiana registered to take part in this discussion on work zone safety. I want to particularly uh, thank one person for joining us, uh, State Representative Jim Pressel, who is uh, chairperson for the House Roads and Transportation Committee and has been a longtime champion of work zone safety along with many other members of the General Assembly. Representative Pressel, thanks for being with us. We appreciate your support. And again, we're very excited uh, to have an opportunity uh, to share with you information on how work zones uh, work and why they are set up the way they are. And we also are excited to answer your questions and get feedback from you uh, because keeping our work zones safe and making sure that everyone gets home safely at the end of the day truly is a partnership. So thank you. Uh, again, we're going to have a lot of information to share about work zone safety. Uh, we'll have a couple of presentations here that will begin momentarily. Um, in addition to that, we'll take your questions and you can share those uh, via the comments feature, also via Facebook and Twitter as well. And we also want to get some feedback from you. And so we'll share a few polls throughout the uh, conversation as well. And finally, we'll close with some ways for you to stay engaged on the issue of work zone safety and some opportunities to learn more information. So our hour is action packed. We've got a lot to get to. And we want to begin by giving you a unique perspective uh, on work zone safety uh, from an angle you've probably not seen before, and that would be the angle of the NDOT worker or the highway contracting crew perspective. These are folks that work uh, just inches uh, from live traffic as they do their job day in and day out. Many of us uh, see a work zone from a very different perspective. We're driving uh, within our car or truck going from point A to point B, uh, but we wanted to give you an opportunity briefly um, to see what it's like from the other angle, if you will. So wanna share that with you before we get into tonight's discussion. So that's just a few seconds and obviously uh, a, a very different experience uh, from what many of us are used to traveling through a work zone. Um, that uh, close proximity to live traffic, uh, moving um, at, at speed exceeding 40, 50, 60 miles an hour is something that uh, our contracting partners and our NDOT crews uh, work in eight, 10, 12 hours a day in all types of different conditions. So that gives you some perspective and hopefully some appreciation on why uh, the issue of work zone safety is so important and why we need your help uh, to make sure that everyone gets home safely. Wanna introduce, uh, before we get to that, um, I did wanna share with you, um, we just saw the highway worker perspective and. We want to keep our, our men and women who build and maintain our infrastructure safe. We also want to keep uh, the people driving through our work zones safe. And, and something that um, you may not know and is oftentimes a surprise to many folks uh, when talking about work zone safety is, uh, is the stat you see on your screen. Four out of five work zone deaths, deaths that result from work zone crashes involve motorists. So there is just as much risk and just as much need uh, for safety to be top of mind for the motorist going through a work zone as it is for our highway workers. Um, so we want to keep that in perspective and top of mind as we go through our conversation this evening and beyond. Want to introduce you to several other folks on our panel. John McGregor is NDOT's Director of Traffic Operations. Misha Kotler is the supervisor for NDOT's work zone safety section, 
And Darcy Bullock is a professor with the Lyles School of Civil Engineering at Purdue University, also director of the Joint Transportation Research Program. And you'll be hearing from each of those gentlemen uh, throughout the conversation, uh, sharing their expertise on work zone safety and helping to answer your questions as well. So now I'll introduce uh, the, the first member of our team, John McGregor, uh, again, NDOT's Director of Traffic Operations. Uh, John is going to take us into our first presentation on work zone safety. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to talk a little bit about work zone safety with uh, the people of the state of Indiana. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, my title is Director of Traffic Operations, and I think that that operational focus is critical. I do work at the Traffic Management Center, and we are focused on making sure that everybody gets through a work zone safely and that workers make it home safely as well. It, it's, we're focused on both prongs of that. Um, so before I get going into the meat of the presentation, we just wanted to offer a poll um, to start out. And we're just curious, have you or someone you know been involved in a work zone crash as a motorist? Um, I'll mention if you're watching live, um, you can click the link in the chat and submit your answer. So with that, I'll pause and um, hopefully get some good feedback. So with five responses, oh, it's changing quick, isn't it? So now we've got six. Um, just give it a couple more seconds, see if anybody else. Okay, it looks like about half and half. And you know, I, th I think that speaks to the point that, you know, collisions in the work zone are a fairly rare event. You know, most people drive through the work zone and there's no problem. But, you know, throughout a driving life and, you know, knowing the people that we do, even though they're rare, they're not completely uncommon. So it shows that the vigilance is, is absolutely critical. Um, somebody helped the statistics there, but it gives us a sense. So, um, it's, it is good to, to be aware that these things do happen. So one of the um, just critical baseline um, topics that we ought to talk about is what are the parts of a work zone? I mean, I, I think instinctively most people know that, you know, you, you've got a beginning and an end, but in the work zone community, we talk about an advanced warning area. This is a critical area to alert motorists what's coming and tell them what they need to do. Um, this, this primarily is an opportunity to um, wake people up that aren't fully attentive, give them some information, and help drivers find their way. Uh, the transition area is also an extremely critical area in the work zone. It, it is arguably the most dangerous um, part of the work zone. In this case, we're looking at a merge condition on, this, on the screen, and that's where a lot of things can go wrong. So the guidance the advanced warning area is so critical. Um, finally, you have the activity area, and that includes more than just the hashed area you see there that is the work area, it includes some other components that we'll talk about as well in some detail. And then the termination area. Purpose of the termination area is to resume normal traffic after navigating the work zone. So following up on that, the advanced warning area, absolutely critical. We, we typically have an array of signs um, offset by a certain defined distance, large, greater distance at higher speeds, less distance at slow speeds. But the key is we want to attract attention, tell what lies ahead, and tell what must be done. In this case, we're looking in this detail at a flagger operation, road work ahead, one lane road, and a flagging emblem to tell them adhere to the flagger, but it applies to the other conditions. So again, this is the advanced warning area. We're trying to attract attention. We've got road construction ahead to alert people that there is a work zone. The next, Left lane closed, half a mile. So we're telling them, hey, you've got a left lane closed. That is what? 
and then what they need to do symbolically, this is the merge right to go with the left lane. And again, we try to, you know, we do space these incrementally. Um, so this, this is a critical area to get people in the mindset to navigate the work zone properly. We talked about briefly the transition area as being the most dangerous, but the um, activity area is also so critical. So at the end of the transition area, we have a buffer space, if possible. It is, it is an optional space, but behind drums, it is an area to escape. If two cars are coming together and cannot uh, merge properly, it is a reset area. Um, I'd, I'd rather a car hit a drum than a, a work zone or a work area. So that's, that's what that is for, and it's critical. We also have um, lateral buffer space. So, you know, we've, we talk about, you know, the workspace in this hatched area. We've got these longitudinal, it, a critical one is beginning, but also at the end of the work area. It also offers some relief, but the lateral buffer space. In work zone operations, this is an extremely important area because the more, the more distance you can give motorists between the work area and the travel area, the better chance you have for success. So we're showing an idealized detail here, a work area, then drums, a lateral offset, and a traffic space. But let's face it, so often we get into conditions such as this, where it is just a tight work zone. We've got, in this case, a truck up against the rumble strips. They don't want to drive on it. They're, they're working. They've taken the, the right lane, in this case, to pave the shoulder, but the drums are in the the, the driving lane. So it becomes tight. The lateral buffer space is so critical because what that serves to do is it closes people down. Um, probably a good time to mention that um, we do have the opportunity to um, enter questions in the chat. And, and I'll pause now and see if there's any questions about just the basic function of the work zone that um, can be addressed. Thanks, John. Again, you can enter questions uh, via the chat feature. You can also share those on Facebook and Twitter as well. I know we've had some folks that uh, commented via Facebook and Twitter uh, on the poll question uh, that John shared at the beginning of the presentation about whether uh, you or someone you know has, has been personally impacted by a work zone crash. Again, Happy to entertain your questions. We, we want this to be a two-way conversation. We've got John and other experts that'll be sharing a lot of information with you about uh, engineering and enforcement and education efforts around work zones, but we wanna answer your questions as well. So one of the things that um, we often uh, are asked at NDOT, whether it be through social media or website or other channels, is why would a motorist sometimes encounter a work zone uh, that doesn't have anyone working in it? Uh, something that you will see on the roads from time to time, a work zone that's set up uh, with reduced speeds and, and barrels in place and, and the orange signage, all of the things, John, that you just described, uh, all of that in place, but no one working. Um, so could you maybe speak to that question of why a motorist uh, would encounter a work zone uh, without uh, any uh, construction workers on site? Certainly, Scott. It, it's frustrating, right? Because as Scott suggested, often we'll lower a speed limit and, and leave it lower, you know, even when workers are not present. That is typically done because even though workers are not present, the design features of the work zone require a lower speed. It's just not safe to travel at the higher speed. And why do we have lanes reduced when, when nothing's going on? Um, some, um, some work activities require a barrier wall, and that's certainly not easy to take up and put down you know, on a daily basis. That's one reason. Often we move drums that, that we can open up and shut down lanes. That's a different situation. But in those cases, um, you know, if we're doing deep patching, Sometimes they just get to a point they, they've opened up their, um, they've got a hole in the roadway and they can't open it back up. But even when they've affected a repair, often with concrete patching, for instance, we've got to allow that concrete to set up and be strong or we'll be back out the very next year or the next couple of years repairing it again. So we really do try to respect motorists, their time, respect the stress we put them under, but also be good stewards of the resources that we have when we, when we make a repair, give it the best chance, for instance, in concrete patching 
bridge deck overlays are another one. You know, it, it takes a moment for it to set up. Um, all right, Scott, I see there's another question here as well. Yeah, it looks like we have a question in from Twitter. Uh, any thought given to the different shades of, of neon being used to capture their attention? So I'm assuming here we're talking about um, the the shades of the uh, PPE, personal protective equipment that you often see um, our, our contractors and NDOT crews wearing on, on sites. So hard hats, safety vests, um, I guess the, the same could apply to, to some of our signage as well. But John, could you maybe talk to uh, or speak to uh, the different colors and shades, why those are used and if there is any um, sort of innovation or experimentation in that space? Sometimes it's best to admit you don't know everything and this, this is one of those cases, but I can speak to the signing. The signing is heavily regulated as defined by the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, METCD. And what that is, is a federal document in Indiana has their own that basically creates the rules about what kind of signing you can use in a work zone and those features. With respect to work zone attire, it, it is also regulated to some extent. Um, we require in-dot workers to um, have a full class three vest, which is a sleeve rather than just a vest itself, which does not have sleeves, we, we want to create the vi visibility. As far as the color goes, um, there are some standard colors. I don't know that that is completely regulated. Um, you, you know, I've seen through the years the hard hats change from white to yellow to orange to green. And on, on one hand, I can see, you know, the neon colors, you know, attracting attention, and that's good. We don't want to go overboard because for the motorists themselves, we want them to look at the roadway. So we want the work zones to be as predictable as possible, but still command the respect and the attention it needs. And, and I'll just quickly add, uh, whether it's AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, when we're talking about signage and pavement markings, or uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, when we're talking about uh, personal protective equipment, those organizations in partnership with the states are continually uh, researching different colors, different reflectivity uh, to determine whether uh, something may work a little bit better than, than what's uh, currently deployed or possibly could have a benefit to be deployed in tandem uh, with something that we already have. So uh, certainly uh, the color and visibility and reflectivity is something that is uh, constantly being looked at, looked at, no, no pun intended, on a, on a regular basis to, to maximize the effectiveness. Thank you for those questions. Again, we'll have more opportunities uh, to get into more questions as uh, we move throughout this conversation. I want to give John, though, an opportunity uh, to share more information on the functioning of, of work zones and the, the engineering and design that goes into work zone setup. Somebody whose husband worked at NDOT and you know, the comment was a semi didn't pay attention and hit the attenuator. I, Sherry makes an excellent point. Driver inattention is something we are constantly trying to deal with. And we want the drivers attentive. We want them looking at the road. We don't want them looking at their cell phones. Very dangerous. So it, it, I, I can only acknowledge, you know, that it's very risky for the in-dot workers and the construction workers that are working out there. And we are trying to um, create the safest work zones possible. I'll throw in also that NDOT is um, actively um, implementing many strategies to try and deal with or combat uh, motorists' inattention and to, to garner their attention. We do that through signs, rumble strips, we use warning lights, we use portable message boards. We even now have protect the queue trucks. I think John will talk about that in a little bit. Um, and you know, we have a lot of these strategies that we're implementing in our work zones for exactly that reason. So, th so thank you for that. Okay, so um, it, that was a pr actually a pretty good lead into 
you know, what is NDOT doing to keep work zones safe? Well, the old tried and true method that we've been using as long as I can remember is we hire law enforcement to go out and work in our work zones. This includes Indiana State Police as well as trained local law enforcement officers as well. What do they do? Um, the main thing that we're trying to do is get them to protect the back of a queue, but their, their function as well is to um, encourage awareness and encourage speed compliance. Um, it's worth mentioning that work zone speed limits on high speed um, roadways are often set around 45 to 55. Our, our interstates are 70 miles an hour, so this is a legitimate speed reduction. And um, I, I can just, you know, I'll say nerd out a little bit that um, we've learned that the best progression, in other words, the best density and speeds to get the combination of the, the highest volume through is around 45 to 55 miles an hour. So we're not trying to get people down to a snail's pace where they create a queue, but we also don't want them driving through at 70 miles an hour. And we've proven that we get good, com better compliance with speeds with law enforcement present. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But ultimately, the number one goal is queue protection. This picture tells a big part of the story that trucks are a big part of the queue issue. Where when we have crashes in the back of a queue, a truck is typically involved for the simple reason they have a harder time getting getting stopped. They're they're not as nimble. It is much more difficult for them to slow down. So we need their attention as early as possible. Um, as I mentioned, the the, the job of a uh, Police in the work zone is queue protection, but they also do enforcement, presence, and traffic control. Um, queue protection is the primary role. We, we hire them to get out there. When we predict that queues will be present, that's where we seek them out primarily. But they also can enforce, and they're often brought out there to enforce. When we're not seeing the compliance we want in the work zone, we see people still speeding through. We encourage our law enforcement to get out there and issue tickets when appropriate to get people slowed down. We want we want the respect of the motorist to protect workers, but to protect the other motorists as well. A critical function. Uh, traffic control. They will, you know, for complex work zones on a needed basis, go out there and close ramps on the high speed roadways. Um, we, we use them to you know divert traffic when necessary. Um, and finally, when things settle down and they're still on a schedule, provide presence protection. This can also be done when workers are doing complicated near moving traffic activities. Um, we want them to respect the work zone, even when there isn't queuing, when they're out there, law enforcement will do that. Another, another innovation that has occurred in the last five years is the use of queue detection and warning systems. Maybe you've seen them. So this detail is somewhat complicated, but it's worth mentioning just very simply that across the top of the screen, what we're showing there is one, two, three, four sensors, a message board, one, two, three, four sensors and a message board. This is a standard setup that these sensors detect volume and speed and um, they're managed to provide the right message. So when there's no queuing, when the work zone's working well, that when people are moving through, the, the message boards will say road work ahead. But as traffic slows down and as queues develop, we, we um, have designed these to tell them slow traffic ahead and be prepared to stop. And um, that message telling them what's ahead is, is absolutely critical. Um, in this case, uh, on the row C, I'll mention that moving is, is back kind of near the work area that we talked about earlier. Slow traffic, be prepared to stop. But we often on the first message will say, okay, you've got slow traffic a certain number of miles. We don't want to breed contempt. We want to tell the motor what's going on. We want it to be accurate so they have good information that they will respect and adjust appropriately. Um, 2020 was, was an exciting year that we took the queue detection and warning system to, a next, to the next level. Um, I-70, basically from Indy all the way to Ohio, we did a number of patching, three contracts with a whole lot of patching operations. Like I said, the whole distance. This involves 69 message boards, including 16 on eight side roads. So you got one on each side and 150 of the sensors that I mentioned before. It was westbound from Lewisburg um, all the way to 465. So it's about a third of the way from the Ohio state line to Dayton as they travel westbound. Eastbound, we um, signed from Mount Comfort Road again to the Ohio state line. Um, we had a more complicated messaging campaign 
And one of the key takeaways of what we used here was we provided travel times. So as I mentioned here, as shown in this slide, no queuing, we still gave them travel time. So if you're 60 miles away and you have 60 minutes, you know it's pretty good. But as traffic slowed and it, it was, it showed that maybe drivers might need to um, consider another route. Um, so you have queuing like in a 15 mile down to eight mile range, we would say possibly slowing traffic, maybe five miles away, six miles away, but give you the travel time that maybe you knew that Ohio was 45 miles, but it was 60 minutes. Maybe you ought to consider something else. And then you got into these where we flash the signs and we're showing be prepared to stop when queuing was eminent. This system is considered to have been very effective to um, provide safe traffic flow in the work zone last year on I-70. So we're, we're excited about what we were able to accomplish and the safety we were able to provide. I'll also mention that on the side roads, we had, we didn't tell people to detour, but we had travel times. And either in the case where there was queuing in both directions or no queuing in either, we just provided travel. When we knew that it was either one direction or another, there were problems, we'd say, 70 West, expect delays, you know, so many minutes to 465 or eastbound. So we had a custom to focus on the direction of a problem when there was a problem. Um, we, we thought it was very effective. Um, this system, and I'll mention the milestone was contractor Gridlock was the maintenance traffic contractor. We had a vendor, and then we used the underlying technology provided by Veramac. They had a dashboard that was, that was highly effective and useful. Um, so these are the message boards out there. This, this case I'm showing you here had the flashing lights. We had sensors as well. The, these are the sensors that they put them on posts and they also had them on the message boards as well. And we had a great um, dashboard as well that showed exactly what was going on. So for my computer, I could see, oh, this is slow traffic ahead, slow traffic four miles. We were able to monitor it as a traffic management function as well. So it was an exciting project. Again, this might be an another good time to have a few questions before moving forward. And um, for that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, John. Again, this is a perfect time to send some questions our way. You can do that via the chat. You can also post those on Facebook and Twitter, and we will, uh, we will do our best to answer those. We have a couple that are already queued up. The first one is a great question from Facebook. Uh, who inspects work zones to see if they're set up correctly and are they inspected? And to help answer that question, I want to bring uh, Misha into the conversation because our work zone safety section uh, is part of the team um, that performs reviews of work zones. So Misha can speak to that in great detail. Yes. Uh, so yes, the answer to the question is yes, uh, work zones are inspected. And it begins out on the job site uh, by the contractor or subcontractor that's involved. Um, there should be somebody certified involved uh, with the setup of the work zone. And uh, you know, through the, the life of the project, uh, the work zone should in theory be uh, looked at and inspected on a daily basis um, and reports uh, should be prepared on a weekly basis. And, uh, and those are provided to NDOT staff. NDOT staff also has a role uh, on the project um, uh, with uh, the day-to-day -day inspection as well and making sure that um, issues are resolved. Um, and then, of course, the work zone safety section, um, you know, we are tasked with many uh, work zone related uh, um, functions, and one of them is to do some work zone uh, safety reviews. Um, we are a small office, um, but we're also tasked statewide. So we're somewhat selective in the work zones that we go out and review typically. Uh, what we'll tr try to shoot for is work zones that um, we can see that there may be some problems. So we go out with an eye towards trying to identify what those problems are and resolving them to make things uh, flow smoother and be safer for the public. I, I think that is great peace of mind for uh, anyone driving through our work zones here in Indiana or uh, performing work in those areas that uh, we have standards and specifications for work zones, and we have uh, multiple uh, points of contact uh, on our team, on the contractor team, and, and Misha within your team um, that make sure that those work zones are set up uh, to standard and that they remain so from start to finish. Another question uh, we've got that is uh, one that we frequently hear about is 
uh, zipper merges. When will uh, work zones uh, begin utilizing zipper merges? Uh, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you at a high level that it depends. Uh, so John and, and Michelle, I'll, I'll let the two of you both speak to uh, how we make determinations about how and when uh, to use zipper merge as it relates to work zones. Sorry, you're on mute, John. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I think you answered the question beautifully. It depends. But to elaborate on that, on high speed, particularly rural work zones, we presently are not pursuing zipper merges because fundamentally we don't want people coming to a, a significant slowdown or stopping on these interstates. These are places where people expect to be able to talk freely and safely. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're slowing down out there, you are potentially creating a queue, you're creating the stress of back and forth, back and forth. And we don't see that as the best way to safely navigate a work zone. However, in some urban areas, they make a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking of corridors, you know, possibly like US 36 going from India out to Avon or something like that, where naturally you have congestion. But the difference there is you have motorists engaged in the driving experience. They're looking for, they're looking at the stoplights, they're looking at other things. And there we think that they're more able to accommodate, oh, there's, there's this other feature that they need to navigate as well. But typically in high speed rural areas where the, we we almost have a sense of entitlement, right? When we're driving, I, I'm not wild about using those in those applications. Misha, did I did I cover it or? Yes, yes. I mean, that all being said, though, uh, the reality is NDOT is looking to implement them um, to some degree in certain spe in specific situations, like John said, where they really make sense in urban areas where, um, you know, we're dealing with the queue that, um, you know, we're trying to uh, avoid it from maybe getting into other areas. The, the zipper merge offers advantages such as getting, getting the actual queue length uh, somewhat shorter. Um, but outside of those areas, for the most part, Indiana is an early merge state. Correct. Great points uh, from both of you. Thank you. And I think, you know, that helps to, I think, further emphasize that not every highway construction pro project is the same and not every work zone is the same because we have highways in, in rural areas and urban areas uh, that, that look and feel and drive in a very different way. And so um, there is a lot of planning and forethought and uh, and careful engineering that goes into deciding uh, when a tool like Zipper Merge makes sense on a given work zone. And we do have time for more questions. We're going to jump back into the presentation, but we'll have a few more opportunities. Again, send questions our way via the comments feature. You can also do that um, through Facebook and Twitter as well. So we welcome those. Please keep sending those our way. And while we've got an opportunity, again, we're, we're paused here for questions and we'll continue to take those. But uh, while we have a little bit of a break, let's introduce another poll question so we can get some feedback from you. And this question is, have you heard about NDOT's Q-Truck initiative? And again, you'll find uh, links to participate in the poll uh, via Facebook and Twitter. Um, and you can also uh, see a, a link to participate in the poll through um, the comments as well. So please click there, um, share your feedback. Uh, Q trucks uh, are a relatively new feature in, in Indiana. John's going to talk about that uh, in more depth here in a moment, but very interested to know uh, whether Q, NDOT's Q truck initiative and, and Q trucks in general are something with which you're familiar and, and something that you've heard about. And um, it, it looks like results are, are kind of mixed. So some folks have, have heard about Q trucks, others uh, others not so much. So um, John, great opportunity here as we have uh, results continuing to come in, we'll keep track of those, but it looks like we do have a fair number of folks that may be familiar, but some that 
we'll be hearing about Q trucks for the first time. So if you've heard of them, we hope you'll uh, learn some things that you didn't know. And uh, if this is your first time hearing about Q trucks, we're excited to share um, some information about that initiative with you. Great. Thanks, Scott. I I'm really excited to see so many people have heard of them and are familiar with them. So with that, um, yeah, INDOTS Protect the Q program, we believe is the next level in trying to manage the risk that exists in work zones, particularly in work zones where queues develop. And this particular slide shows, shows a great number of things. You know, it, it shows the crash we're trying to avoid. It shows a wonderful picture of one of the Q trucks we're using presently. And it shows some of the data that we're looking at that Darcy's gonna talk about extensively in, in the coming discussion. So um, what are we trying to protect? Um, we're trying to protect against secondary crashes. That is, that is such a huge um, risk factor in these work zones. And, and this, I'll step into the data very briefly. This slide of the P shows a primary crash. And these are very simple to, look, to understand. It just to look at, you know, you've got a space-time diagram. It's showing the direction of travel, which is downward. The red shows that the queuing started. We had a, a primary event, more queuing developed, and then that black dot is, is a secondary crash, and it was a fatality. So that led to miles of backup and congestion. People just stopped. That white data shows the stop condition. And so then you have yet, yet another in the back of the queue, another event. So it, it, this slide speaks to the fact that it just can snowball once you have an event in these high speed, particularly rural um, work zones. So another, another view of um, the condition there that happened. So this one was um, near Frankfurt on I-65, mile marker 159. Um, this is not just a that problem, this is a national problem. You know, we've got some uh, statistics there. This is 2019 data. Works on crashes nationally, 115,000. Injury involved crashes, 27 of them. 762 works on fatalities. And um, Indiana, unfortunately, does have their share. As I've mentioned before, back of queue collisions represent a significant risk to all the works on stakeholders. And the secondary back of queue, as I showed there before, the most catastrophic. That's what we're really shooting for here. Um, I, I've, I've got to um, acknowledge Tennessee TDOT's Protect the Q program. They were the first that did this. Um, they, they originally built a program with their own forces when, when NDOT wanted to do something similar. And it's no accident the logos are similar because we're trying to create almost a brand of this. Uh, we wanted to put them in the construction projects as the first step. So we, we took a concept that they had, and hopefully we made it a little bit better. But as a proof of concept, um, I had the Hoosier Helpers in 2019 out there, you know, protecting the queue, just using the, a be prepared to stop sign in the back of the trucks, staying in advance of the queue. Some of you might remember on 465, we were, we were doing patching all over the place. This kind of transient work, we were working in one location one weekend and, and another location another, People don't acclimate to it. They're not sure what is where. And this message we discovered was really a good way to alert motorists that, hey, they need to be vigilant. There's a problem in the immediate um, future down the road. So this, this is what we proved would work. Just this message, this critical message, be prepared to stop, was an effective message. But we had a lot of fun trying to um, figure out how to um, create a truck that would work in the work zone. As you see here, we were using them an NDOT pickup truck. This is one of our Hoosier Helper pickup trucks. And we decided to go to a small uh, panel on the back just as, as a concept. But after um, working with industry, collaborating with um, the construction companies, we decided that we didn't want to go small. We wanted to go big and create a truck that commanded respect and wouldn't be missed. So what you see here is an NDOT attenuator truck that's used for the paint trucks. Notice it has a, mess a message board on it. And um, here they have a paint crew ahead. Well, we basically wanted to take it to the next level and put a be prepared to stop. Nothing in this design is an accident. We have emergency lights with almost what I call a schizophrenic flashing sequence to command attention. We've got be prepared to stop and we've got the emergency hatching to also command the respect. So this, this is what 
we ultimately developed um, in collaboration with the construction lobby. Again, this picture is a prototype from early on showing just something that we manufactured in the shop to help show that what we wanted to use in the field. Oh, sorry, but we didn't stop there. We wanted to capitalize on connected vehicle technology. Connected vehicle is a buzz term. Hopefully in the next 15, 20 years, most of the new vehicles are gonna be talking to the cloud, giving data about what's going on in the roadway that can be used and also availing themselves of data that exists about um, what's up ahead. We see it as a two-way path. The Haas alert is the beginning of that. These people have a transmitter that we've put into the trucks that when the trucks stop, when they're protecting the queue, they, they harvest that information, they've got proximity and they report it to Waze, which is um, the, the state of the art used app that so many people use for traveling. They use it to know what's going on the roadway. If there's a work zone or a problem, if there's an ambulance, Waze reports it. Next, next step would be to get it into Google traffic, which we don't see as far away. But we innovated that as a protective means to um, help these Q trucks stay safe and also help protect motorists. We want to protect everybody involved. Um, one of the critical aspects of this was the placement of the trucks. As you see here in this slide, um, we're showing a queue forming. You know, you've got a traffic incident in this case, a bottleneck, a back of queue. We're wanting to put these trucks a half mile, quarter mile at the closest before the motorist gets there. This will give a motorist the chance to ass assess that they're being given information, in this case, be prepared to stop, and then recognize, yeah, they need to stop. And we, we originally wanted um, these trucks to adjust, um, much like the Hoosier helpers did, but ultimately we settled in on two trucks leapfrogging each other as the safest way to protect all. I'll mention that we've got a website out there that gives a lot more information. Um, be, be pre, or, sorry, prepared to stop.com is the website. There's, there's a nice training video as well as additional information about the program. We're, we're really proud of this. This has been well received by industry. Um, but who have some skepticism before we started this, but a great deal of them now have grown to respect and appreciate what we're doing. So this is um, a truck in 2020. Um, the message was good. This is just pixelated photography. So it was likely this was slow traffic ahead or stop traffic ahead. But again, it shows the very first trucks that were out there. Um, we went on, and again, this is a picture you saw originally. This is a better, better prototype. Now, this particular vendor went the next level. They have on the very bottom, it says recording work zone, but it also has speed of motorists as well. So they've taken, industry's taken it to the next level additionally. Um, as I mentioned, um, this has been celebrated. This was a, a showcase back in April where industry showed off the various Q trucks. You can see three in the background. The Hoosier helpers were there as well, showing their involvement. It was a good day to kind of celebrate what we've done and the safety we think we're bringing to the, to the motorists and the workers. So uh, with that, I'll just offer the, the final um, um, you know, picture we had. Um, next speaker, speaker, Darcy Bullock, is there on the right. I'm, I'm in the center, and we just had everybody involved that built these trucks that um, were involved in the implementation. We're, we're so proud of this effort. We, um, we think we're making a difference with it. So with that, it's possibly another good time to maybe have some questions, and I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, John. We do have a, a question about um, how these trucks uh, move within a work zone. Um, and uh, that comes to us from Facebook. Is the Q-Chuck uh, the one that backs up on the highway? Uh, please explain its process. Uh, John, if, if you would, um, could you answer that question about um, kind of how those trucks uh, move around within a work zone and why they do that? Sure. As I'd mentioned, um, we, we settled on a standard where they leapfrog each other. So in an initial setup, you would want to put the first truck about a half mile to a quarter mile in advance of where the queue exists. You'd have a second truck upstream, so behind that first truck, ready to step into place. And, the, and then as traffic um, queued up, moved toward that first truck and overtook it, the second truck would move into a position to protect the queue, and the first truck would drive through, around, circle back, and create a supporting position. 
So we have two Q trucks by the standard in operation. Only one should be actively pr protecting the Q. The other one is supporting it. Typically, contractors don't want to back up on the interstate, although we've seen some instances where they have. But we've set up this program where they don't have to, rather they circle back around. Um, we were successful using the Hoosier helpers to back up, and I, I see that question deliberately asked. But we're asking the contractors to advance out and circle back rather than back up on the roadway. I think that uh, helps to, to drive home the point uh, as you drive through these work zones um, that they, they evolve depending on time of day, the, the type of work going on at a given time and, uh, and uh, the amount of traffic uh, that you encounter and the movement of a queue, of a queue truck uh, depending on on the length of that queue, where it starts, and and and, uh, and, and where it where it starts at one time uh, of day uh, versus another time of day is just one example of why it's so important to always be alert, avoid those distractions, keep your full attention on driving, so that you can be prepared to adjust and recognize that uh, driving through a work zone at, at at 9 a.m. on a Sunday may be very different than driving through at uh, 7 a.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, and so we, you know, we use those Q trucks at different locations, different positions within a work zone to give that appropriate uh, amount of advanced warning uh, to help keep everyone safe. We'll have time for more questions. Again, share those via the comments. Also, you can post those to Facebook and Twitter as well. Love the questions that we've had so far. I know that uh, I've learned some things from the questions that have been posed. So please continue to share those with us. And as we move forward, uh, John has talked a lot about um, the, the, the engineering behind uh, why work zones are set up the way they are, and some of the innovative tools and technology that we have on the ground in the work zone uh, to enhance safety. I want to bring Darcy Bullock into the conversation. Uh, Darcy is instrumental in, in an effort and partnership between his team at the JTRP and Purdue University and NDOT in looking at the data and results of our work zone safety efforts in real time so that we can continuously improve and look for ways to, uh, e to enhance our efforts, uh, to embrace innovation and work to uh, reach our ultimate goal, which is reduce the number of work zone crashes, reduce the number of injuries and fatalities. So Darcy, want to turn it over to you to share uh, the, the data-driven uh, approach to uh, work zone safety that we embrace here in Indiana. Uh, thank you, thank you, Scott. Uh, Scott, you've done a fantastic job moderating. I hope I can live up to uh, Stimulating the same level of questions that John McGregor has done. He's been a great uh, colleague to partner with on this. And just to iterate, reiterate a couple of things, I think, Scott, you let off the presentation by uh, commenting that four out of five of the fatalities in work zones are, are drivers or passengers. And 50% of our crashes occur at the back of that work zone or that queue. And so the, the the dialogue that John just went into in the back of queue is an important area that we've been working with uh, INDOT on. And I think uh, in Indiana and Hoosier should be proud of how innovative and aggressive INDOT has been on uh, developing and implementing uh, the Q truck technology. Um, I'm just going to quickly just um, uh, talk about two phases of uh, the research partnership we've had with INDOT. First of all, uh, we do a weekly work zone report. Uh, INDOT uh, has performance measures on all their traffic work zones. Misha and John are integral part of that team. And uh, the Purdue team puts together performance measures that track crashes um, by, by location and, and district as well as uh, congestion. But as, as John alluded to, the new frontier of data is um, that connected vehicle data that we're, we, we pull in from approximately 5% of the vehicles out there driving on the interstate, which gives us a good sample size to 
make informed decisions. And it can be all the way down to specific mile marker locations. And just conceptually, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but conceptually, the taller bars are areas where we want to take a, look, a closer look at. And that, when you look at all the miles of interstate construction underway, we can get down to a mile or two to take a look at. That's really important information. And in some ways, we're building upon the insurance industry's efforts in this area. Insurance industry has, uh, for several years, correlated hard-breaking events with, with crash risk. And so INDOT is, is building on that concept. And uh, we ingest uh, every 12 hours anonymized hard-breaking events out there on the interstate. So we don't know where, we don't know who generated them, but we know the approximate mile marker and we know the approximate time down to about a minute on where those hard-breaking events occur. And so if we can identify specific locations on the interstate, that gives us focus in terms of where to look. So uh, John has uh, pointed out uh, one of the levers or tools in the toolbox for INDOT uh, is the use of these Q trucks out there on the interstate. And one of the things that we've done, and I think this is, a, John and I have done several national webinars on this, but states across the country are looking at the success that INDOT is having on deployment of these. And that's what I want to share with you today. So I'm going to share with you in the, the Lebanon construction zone, um, just to orient you in terms of, of mile markers. If you look along the side of the road, you'll see these blue mile markers. That's the 145.8, a little bit different view of that same area. So um, we generate these heat maps, as John indicated earlier. This particular one on the, the right-hand side is about a 20-mile range from mile marker 130 to 150. This is one day view zero to 24 hours and it's on i-65 south and then that purple line are the q truck locations that are brought in from the telematics data and if people are curious about what a hard breaking event is it's about 0.27 g a, a relatively aggressive uh braking maneuver that we really don't want to see happening on the interstate maybe not locking up the tires but it's an aggressive uh braking maneuver so what we do is we look at a uh, what we call a, a heat map in both directions. This is showing the uh, northbound direction, the southbound direction. This is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And we then put on that map the hard breaking uh, locations. I'm going to show you some early results from April and then some more recent results uh, from May. And then we also overlay on that um, in addition to the hard braking, these purple lines are the location, the purple lines are the location of the, the Q trucks. And I'm gonna show you just these two examples in, in the, the probably just the greater Lebanon area, just a little bit north of there. Uh, if we look on the, the left here, um, see the purple line, this is a location where we had a Q truck present and we had about two hard braking events in five hours. We look in the other direction an unplanned incident and we had queuing and you can see we had nine hard breaking events in three hours and you can see all of those hard breaking events those are at the back of the queue and that's what uh, john pointed out is the area that we focused and the factoid is 50 percent of our crashes in and around work zones are rear end collisions and that's the high risk point and john had that uh, very sad photo of a uh, back of queue crash uh, in the Frankfurt area of those are the types of crashes that we want to eliminate uh, by the use of the Q truck. The other technology that's on the Q truck, in addition to what John talked about with the uh, flashing strobes and the message boards, is um, INDOT has been an early adopter of what's called the host alert technology. And uh, there's telematics on both the INDOT Who's Your Helpers as well as our INDOT contract or the contractor Q trucks that when the vehicles are stopped and they have their strobe lights on, that injects an alert into Waze. And many times motors put alerts into Waze, but that's a distract somewhat of a distracted driving and they're not necessarily precise. INDOT can put in with these host alert uh, injections, put in very high quality, precise locations 
Um, and this is the new frontier. Um, we've talked a lot about the MUTCD, the Manual Uniform Traffic Control, Control Devices for guidance on putting um, construction signing out there. The next frontier is how do we get that in a structured and safe manner into the vehicle so we, we can communicate uh, to the motors and in, increase the alertness. Um, I'm going to conclude with what I think is just a really, really dramatic example of how successful the INDOT Q truck has been and why other states are looking at this. If we look at the, uh, I got this set up in two columns. This is May 26 and then May 27. May 26, I'm showing you a location uh, down near Lebanon area where the Q truck was used and we had three hard braking events. The next day, uh, we had a, con a, a construction zone up here with some queuing. This particular one was an older project that didn't have a Q truck in it, and we had 29 hard braking events. So when you can see, you know, pick your number, a factor nine reduction in hard braking. I want to remind you of that curve that we showed you or that graph we showed you at the beginning. If we can shift those hard braking events to the left, we're going to reduce those uh, crashes. So if we can reduce hard braking events by a factor of nine, we can reduce crashes by a factor of nine. Not all of the deployments are going to be that successful, but that's uh, a very promising uh, aspect. And I think right now it's still unclear what contribution is coming by, by the lights, what's coming by ways, but that total package of the Q trucks that John McGregor and team have put together of the ways and the visual alerting is absolutely having an impact on reducing crashes. And I absolutely believe it's going to reduce crashes in Indiana, as well as that very large number of 115,000 crashes across the United States. So to kind of recap, John had this slide earlier. We both are a strong believer in this. Our vehicles know more about the, the roads oftentimes than we do. The connected vehicle data is a brand new frontier. INDOT is ingesting about 12 billion records a month. And they're also a partner by providing also, in addition to reading, reading the data from connected vehicles anonymously, they're providing high quality information on where those back queues are with the Q truck that is going to help reduce crashes. I did, couldn't, I'd be remiss without acknowledging all of the partners that we have had in this project. And with that, Scott, I'll leave this with the same message that I started out with, and I'll turn it over to you for questions in the remaining time that we have. Thank you, Darcy. That, that was tremendous information. And hopefully uh, for, for those folks that have joined us, uh, they, they walk away knowing that uh, Indiana is on the leading edge of using uh, this real-time data uh, via connected vehicles uh, to design and operate the safest possible work zones we can. And th this data is, is not only helping to inform decisions, but it, as Darcy just pointed out, uh, it's indicative that uh, some of the technology that we're deploying with Q trucks and advanced Q warning systems and the host alert system, uh, those are paying dividends because we're seeing uh, we're seeing those res positive results in that data as well, which is very encouraging. Uh, we do have time for more questions. Again, submit those uh, via Facebook, Twitter, or in the comments section as well. Uh, we do want to. Uh, before we do want to let you know we're short on time, but uh, we want to get to as many uh, of your questions as possible, and we, we still have time to fit those in. So again, Facebook, Twitter, or via the comments section. Uh, we do have one coming our way via Twitter, uh, which is how um, does one connect their vehicle? How uh, would someone uh, be in a position to use their vehicle to uh, provide data? Um, that can be uh, used to help inform work zone safety. Um, Darcy, I want to want to bring you back in uh, to help answer that question. Sure. So many of the, the the modern vehicles that have built in navigation where you see uh, traffic uh, displayed, um, part of the, the 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 agreement you do is you can opt in to sh share that information and approximately. 
5% of the motorists out there. Uh, the provider that we're using for data is Wejo, and uh, that they continue to add additional automotive partners every week. So I would refer to, the, to their website and they've, they've listed some of their partners uh, in terms of the automotive brands that they're bringing data in from. I think it's worth noting uh, that as uh, evolution continues in the automotive sector um, and, and car, cars turn over, folks opt to, to trade in or, or, or sell and, and upgrade to newer vehicles, that we see more and more uh, vehicles that are equipped with this type of connected technology on the roadway. So uh, as we progress, uh, the, the potential is there to see more comprehensive data and uh, better refined data to help inform these efforts. Another question that we want to touch on, um, going back to Q warning systems, is at what point uh, will there be more of these uh, around the state or when will these be seen all over the state? So uh, I'll open it up to our entire panel, John, uh, Misha, and Darcy. Um, I think to uh, to address this question, it's a good one. John, you're probably the best equipped to answer that one. You're on mute, John. Okay, these are a resource and they're also something that needs to be maintained. And so it's not practical to put them on every site. We you know, through the designers, select projects where you have high queuing or high chances of work zones blowing up sporadically. Um, but really, it's it's project management decision for best use. Presently, we're using them in eastern central Indiana, southeast Indiana, um, western central Indiana, and I believe in northwest Indiana. So they are around, but the order of magnitude, I think we, we have something like uh, six of them active active right now, not 600. So we do use them selectively in the most dangerous work zones in the, in the, in the you know, it, where you've got high volume, high chance of congestion, high chance of sporadic queues developing. We want, we're trying to use them where we can get the best protection for the motors and the workers. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, we were talking about uh, zipper merge earlier, and, and that's a tool that uh, makes sense in some work zones and not others. And I think that the same thought applies to the Q warning system is we want to put those in project areas where we can maximize the impact, get the best bang for your buck, if you will. So, uh, Absolutely. But, I, but I think that's a great question. And again, we're happy to take more questions. Uh, so please continue to send those our way. Um, how do we decide if a work zone will be a full full road closure or will be a partial closure? So maintaining uh, some live traffic through a zone versus completely shutting it down. Uh, could you talk to uh, some of the thought process and decision making that goes into that? Misha, would you like to start, start off? Sure. Uh, you know, th so there's this is a big question, and it's it's a question that needs to be uh, asked and answered early in the life of a, a project. Um, and you know, so part of that is looking at traffic volumes and and doing a queue analysis to see uh, how much queuing we can expect for different types of work zones. So one thing to factor in, you know, queue detection uh, and warning systems are a great tool but they're only needed if the type of work zone that we're implementing is going to be generating queuing. Uh, there are strategies that allow us to not utilize or, or not uh, uh, cause as much queuing, uh, but you know everything has a, a cost associated with it and those tend to be more costly. You see those type of work zones, um, you know, especially where we're doing extremely large um, types of uh, construction, uh, sort of like uh, around 465 or you know, on in and around uh, Indianapolis. Um, when the question of full road closure comes into play, uh, especially for something like an interstate, when we're looking at closing down a major route like that, the question then becomes, where are you going to put all that traffic? So part of the, um, you know, the, the calculation needs to include, are there alternative routes? So 
in and around 465, where you've got, uh, when you close down a section of 465, a network of other routes that can uh, take the traffic. Um, we, you know, we're doing that right now with our North Split closure downtown, where we have sections closed, and we're utilizing different uh, detours uh, with the available routes in the area. Um, you know, so those are things that factor into uh, the decision as to whether or not we're going to uh, do a full road closure. There's a lot of people that are involved in this decision. It's not just INDOT on when we're talking about interstates, um, the FHWA will be involved in, in that discussion, pardon me as well. And, um, you know, so there's, you know, many parts of INDOT, you know, from construction to project management to um, us and work zone safety, um, you know, and, and more that are involved with uh, this question and answering that question. John, you, you want to add something? Sure. I'll just add that, you know, there, there's action and reaction. For instance, we closed 465 on the southeast side several years ago to get some work done very quickly. And the ramification, we, one thing we just didn't expect was how heavy the traffic would be all the way on the other side of town on 465 on the northwest side. Um, the flip side is the, the North Split project that most everybody is very well aware of. We're getting j done a job in 18 months that could have taken several years to do. So, again, cost, benefit, you know, there's a plus side, you know, and a downside to each decision. We weigh out those factors. There needs to be a risk assessment, a cost assessment, yeah. safety assessment, and it's a balancing act of all of those. Well stated, perfect. So before we close out uh, the discussion, let's take a moment uh, to look to the future. Uh, we've talked a lot about innovation tonight and uh, new tools and technology and data uh, that are being used to make our work zones as safe as possible and inform our decision-making. What else is out there on the horizon um, that that uh, people can expect to see or that can can help uh, our efforts uh, to keep people safe. And I'll start again. It, you know, NDOT is, is looking at other technologies as well um, and incorporating them into our work zones. We've, I, I've been very proud to, to be involved with uh, the work zone safety section and our involvement in getting these technologies into projects and i'm talking about things like the queue detection and warning system or the uh, dynamic lane merge system um, or the automated um, uh, travel time systems so these are our tools that are um, already being implemented but there's others that have yet uh, been brought into uh, the state uh, for example um, one that I, i'm hoping to see in projects in indiana soon might be um, automated warning systems at construction ingress and egresses uh, where we've got vehicles going in and out of a work zone. Uh, this, these type of systems can provide, um, you know, advanced alerts and notifications to motorists to let them know that, hey, there's a truck going to come in or there's a truck uh, um, going into the work zone that may be slowing down. Uh, again, it, with a mind towards, uh, you know, letting the motorist be more aware of the situation that's occurring. And I'll just add to that, an example of something we looked at last year was presence lighting, the simple act of putting lights sequentially in advance of the work zone. And lo and behold, I'll let Darcy speak to it, you know, we had an eight mile an hour speed reduction between when we didn't use the presence lighting and when we did. And that got it down to a speed that was, you know, the optimal in that, you know, 45, 55 mile an hour range. So that, that was a tremendous result. Darcy has been a leader. He is the leader of uh, the research that NDOT does. That's, that's what he does at JTRP. And, and certainly, I'm sure he can speak a great deal more than I can about it. Uh, John, I think you summarized the impact of lighting perfectly. And I think sometimes it's some of these simple things that um, we measure, we validate, and, and then NDOT uh, implements in this, as Mr. said, it's that cost benefit uh, evaluation. I'd also like to add, because uh, I saw a number of comments talking about, wow, the data that Purdue has um, put together and, and the tools that they've prepared. Um, I think Indiana is truly blessed to have Purdue uh, and JTRP. I mean, Purdue is, is, is uh, truly a gem. 
And, uh, you know, from the work zone safety perspective, the tools that uh, Darcy and his team have developed, such as the heat map that he demonstrated and the hard breaking tools, they are so crucial to the decisions that we make, um, you know, or, or helping us um, be alerted to work zones that need our attention. Uh, just, you know, the, what we're able to do in terms of technology and, you know, just the data to me is amazing. We've got a question uh, coming in. Again, feel free to send those our way uh, through Facebook, Twitter, and also in the comments. Um, what about cameras and work zones? Uh, John, if you want to speak to that, I know that is uh, something that we do see in some states around the country. Uh, it's been a topic of discussion here in Indiana. And, uh, you know, we have been, INDOT has been a partner in, uh, in talking with uh, with law enforcement, um, our partners in the General Assembly, others on on uh, on the topic of speed cameras and and what impact that could potentially have. Right. So I wanted to point out cameras and there are cameras as a traffic management function and the vision of traffic management where I work. We we utilize cameras all over the state to monitor and manage traffic operations, to get messages out on the message boards, to help advise motorists, to um, allocate resources, to move people where they need to go, you know, whether get maintenance to respond to a circumstance, call police or whatever. Those are cameras. Those are in-dot infrastructure devices. Now, if the question is about video enforcement, as Scott suggested, there is interest in video enforcement in Indiana, but presently it is not available by state statute. And to advance that, we, we need a legislative change. And I, I am aware that the construction lobby is working on that, but presently it's not an option. So we have a great opportunity there as we get set to, uh, to, to close out our conversation to forecast um, what is in the head, what is ahead um, in work zone safety. This is an area uh, that I hope everyone that's taken part in our conversation tonight recognizes that we are constantly looking for ways to improve, uh, ways to enhance our efforts. So uh, you'll continue to see uh, data, more data, different types of data informing our decision-making decision, decision process and, and seeing uh, more, more and different types of technology uh, out in our work zones, uh, helping to keep you, your family safe, and those that build and maintain our roadways. We've talked a lot tonight about uh, what is happening in the three major key components of work zone safety being education, enforcement, and engineering. But we wanna to close tonight by emphasizing the fact that we need your help. Uh, this truly is a partnership between uh, INDOT, our contractor partners, our law enforcement partners, and you. And you play a major role in two of the uh, most critical ways uh, that you can help us to keep everyone safe is one, slow down. Follow those work posted work zone speed limits. Be alert, be attentive. You see that on your screen right now we say that, we mean avoid distractions. Put your cell phone down. Indiana has a, a hands-free law that's been in effect now for almost a year, uh, one year anniversary of that later this week. Um, not only is it, is it the law in the state of Indiana, but it's one of the most effective ways that you can keep yourself safe and those around you safe is putting that cell phone down, using hands-free technology if you have to uh, place a phone call or take a phone call. If you don't have hands-free technology in your vehicle, pull off to a safe location, stop your vehicle, take that phone call. Um, that is one of the most important things you can do to, to, to keep folks safe is avoiding distractions. Uh, because again, to go back to the point about data, the, the two uh, leading causes of work zone crashes are speed and distracted driving. Um, and those generally are, are on the responsibility of the driver. 
to operate their vehicle safely. So slow down, pay attention, avoid those distractions. You see it there on your screen. Be alert, be attentive, help us keep everyone safe, do your part. We're reaching the end of our discussion tonight, which has been incredibly informative. And I wanna thank uh, John, Misha and Darcy for their time and their expertise. Uh, these are leaders in their fields and they spend a lot of their time and focus and resources on working to eliminate and reduce the risk of crash wherever possible uh, to keep everyone safe in our work zones and allow the work that needs to happen to maintain our infrastructure to happen safely. Uh, really appreciate the information you shared tonight and helping us to, to answer questions as well. We'll keep the conversation going beyond just our town hall this evening, and you can do that by giving us input and continuing to ask questions. Two ways to do that are on your screen right now. One is online at n.4u.com. Um, you can ask questions through our customer service portal there. You can also call us anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 855-N.4U. Uh, happy to help answer your questions and take feedback there as well. I thank our panelists. I want to thank you for participating with us. And again, another opportunity uh, for you to learn more is on our website. Uh, you see it on the screen, screen there, in.gov slash dot. We've got a wealth of information there about work zone safety, a lot more background on, on everything that we've talked about tonight. So. We hope that you will visit that web page as well to learn more. And again, those questions, keep them coming. Uh, we're closing out our, our first virtual town hall on work zone safety, but we anticipate doing more of these and we're happy to engage with you and appreciate uh, your interest in, in this issue and hope that you take away information tonight to help keep you and your fellow motorists and the people that are taking care of our highways and local roads all across the state of Indiana safe. Thank you.